And here we have the figure of justice. And I find this very fascinating because when we choose this angle, and I have a very simple print of the woman with the balance by Johannes Vermeer. And you look at her expression of her face and the gesture of her hand. It looks as if it is inspired by this statue. Let me just put them side by side. This is the woman with the balance, a painting from around 1664 by Johannes Vermeer. We see a woman with a balance and behind her hangs a painting depicting the last judgment. She appears to be pregnant, the balance is empty, but the positioning of the balance, the subject of the painting in the background, and her possibly pregnant belly provide ample reason for various associations regarding the meaning of the work. In this video, I want to show what I believe to be one of the inspirations, specifically the mausoleum of William of Orange in the new church in Delft. In this video, I aim to provide more insight into this mausoleum that already existed before Vermeer's time and explain why I think Johannes Vermeer might have drawn inspiration from it. On the left, we have a painting by Pieter de Hoog that might have served as a prototype for Vermeer's work. It was created during the same period around 1664 and it is hard to determine who came first. When you observe the poses of Vermeer's figures, it becomes evident that he manages to render them in a more beautiful and monumental manner than other painters. In this instance, his woman with the balance stands out as much more exquisite and mysterious compared to the figure depicted by Pieter de Hoog. Vermeer paints the woman with the balance in a more upright stance, with her head slightly inclined to the right. Her hand delicately holds the balance with a graceful gesture. Here I've placed figures painted by Pieter de Hoog, Johannes Vermeer and the figure on the corner of the mausoleum side by side. There are differences between Vermeer's figure and the one on the mausoleum, but the tilt of the head and the overall slightly leaning posture of the torso, which play a crucial role in the impression of Vermeer's figure, correspond. The face resembles the face of the sculpture, I took this photo while there was some artificial lighting in the church, but even the natural light filtering through the windows corresponds to the figure of Vermeer. The arm is positioned differently, but when you compare the hands, you can observe similarities between the delicate gesture of the figure painted by Vermeer and the hand of the mausoleum figure. If you pay attention to the thumb and the index finger, the way the middle finger is placed against them, and then how the ring finger and the pinky are somewhat apart from them, you can see that the hand gestures of the sculpture and Vermeer's painting align to a significant extent. William of Orange, also known as William the Silent, was an important statesman and military commander who played a crucial role in the Eighty Years' War 
and the establishment of the Dutch Republic, also known as the United Provinces. He is known as the father of the fatherland in the Netherlands. Here we can see a sculpture of Willem van Oranje, William of Orange. <laughs> And he was murdered in the Prinsenhof there in that building. Um, I won't go inside now, but you can even see the bullet holes when he was murdered. So It's a museum now and there you see the Oude Kerk, Lange Jan, they call it here I believe and that's where Johannes Meer was buried after his passing but on the left there is this large building and that's the place where Willem van Oranje was murdered. The mausoleum we are talking about is located in the Nieuwe Kerk in Delft. In 1614, the construction of the mausoleum began, crafted by sculptor and architect Hendrik de Keizer. After its passing in 1621, his son Pieter completed it. You can fully walk around the monument. No costs or efforts were spared. Expensive materials were used, such as gold, black marble, bronze, Italian white marble, and portoro, a type of marble with golden veins. Inside the monument we can see various symbols. Four bronze female figures at the corners represent the principles that William of Orange stood for. This statue represents liberty. She is holding a hat. This one represents justice. She holds the balance. Strength and courage with a branch and a lion's belt. And faith, religion. She is holding a model of a church and she is reading the Bible. We also see the dog of William of Orange. Allegedly, it refused to eat and died after his death. A dog symbolizes loyalty. The little dog was named Pompey, and it is said to have once saved the life of William of Orange. Pompey also accompanied William of Orange on military campaigns. When William was sleeping in the army tent in the French town of Hermigny, Spanish attackers sneaked into the tent to assassinate him. By scratching, barking, and eventually jumping on his face, Pompey woke up, William of Orange allowing him to escape in time. The sculpted dog, with its alert gaze, appears to reference this history. We see William of Orange depicted twice on this monument. As a military commander in armor and on his deathbed. A touching detail is how the feet of William of Orange press against the body of the dark Pompey. It's as if the cold marble is forming itself here. This adds a very human touch to the mausoleum amidst all its elevated symbolism. At the foot end we see a woman holding two trumpets. 
one is for good reputation and the second kept unused is for bad reputation. The dual depiction of William of Orange is generally interpreted as a tribute to the two sides of William's life, as a father of the fatherland and as a human being. It reflects his significant role in Dutch history, encompassing both his military leadership and his civic values. On the mausoleum, there are also reliefs attached with inscriptions that refer to the life and beliefs of William of Orange. One of those inscriptions is a Latin phrase, Saevis tranquillus in undis. This literally translates to calm amid raging waves or peaceful amid turbulent waters. This expression describes someone who remains calm and undisturbed in the midst of chaos or difficulties. It embodies the idea of composure and stability in the face of adversity or challenge. You could say that this thought also resonates with the work of Johannes Vermeer, which was created during that tumultuous era. In a broader sense, it's possible to argue that Vermeer might have drawn inspiration from the grandeur and regal quality of these sculptures. As you observe the sculpture, I'm not implying that he directly used it as a model for the milkmaid, for example. Considering the mosaic of influences that shaped him as a young artist, the opposing nature of these sculptures could have sparked his creativity. This potentially led him to blend a certain dignified manner of posing figures into his genre paintings. Taking the milkmaid as an example, its impact arises from the amalgamation of both the intimate and the stately essence of the scene. The intriguing presence of this tomb, featuring figures striking a profoundly regal pose invites us to reflect on Vermeer's artworks. Do you notice any resemblance to specific Vermeer paintings in this context? In the case of the woman with the balance, I believe I see a direct influence from the sculpture depicting justice. However, you can also view the influence more broadly. When comparing an early work like Vermeer's The Procurus to, for instance, Rembrandt's Prodigal Son in a Brothel, it is notable how solemnly Vermeer portrayed the figures of the Prodigal Son and the prostitute he is associated with. Similarly, when you compare the milkmaid with similar compositions, such as this work by Van Odekerke, there is also this solemn and sculptural quality to Vermeer's work which reminds me of the figures on the mausoleum. I believe it is quite plausible that Vermeer was influenced by the atmosphere exuded by the sculptures of the memorial monument, blending a similar gravity and solemnity into the themes he explored. Of course, there could be multiple influences at play. But 
The close proximity of this impressive monument made me want to emphasize this potential influence. The solemnity that Vermeer employs creates a kind of contrast in his work, melding the everyday with the sublime, much like the endearing portrayal of the intimate bond between William of Orange and the dark Pompey also evokes a contrast within the grandeur of the mausoleum. We are here standing at the market square of Delft and we see the Nieuwe Kerk, the new church in English, the Nieuwe Kerk in front of us and on the left of the Nieuwe Kerk that is where Johannes Vermeer lived. So I'm going to walk now to the spot where Johannes Vermeer lived in his youth and then to give you an idea of how close he lived uh, close to the tomb of Willem van Oranje uh, I will take a little walk in real time from Mechelen, where Mechelen stood where Johannes Vermeer uh, lived as a teenager and where the tomb is so we enter the Nieuwe Kerk and then we take a look there so now I'm walking towards the spot. You see that empty spot between those houses there, there to the left. And it's the Oude Manhuis Steeg, Old Ben's House Alley, if you translate it literally. So we are approaching now where Johannes Vermeer lived and I think he must have started painting here. <laughs> so we see the house of the, the building of the Guild of St. Luke, the reconstruction. And in front of us, where, where those people are walking, that here was the front door. So. I'm going to stand at the spot where the front door was with the two towers. That is where he lived in his uh, adult years and that's where he painted most of his paintings. But now we are going to the left. Let's take a look at the Nieuwe Kerk. It's a very high tower. And then I'm going, and now I'm going in real time to the Nieuwe Kerk. The statue of Hugo de Groot. It was in Darren Vermeer's time. There used to be a wall here. So if he went into the church, he walked this way. And then he could go left. So we... I try to be historically correct in this. What a beautiful dog. Wow. A husky, I think. Wait for the ticket. And here we are in a new kerk. And he was, Johannes Vermeer was baptized here. So I think that it must have been here. That's the most logical place, I guess. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was also baptized in this church. And let's walk towards the tomb of William of Orange, Willem van Oranje. Thank <laughs> you. 
So here we are. And as you can see, it's very close to where Johannes Vermeer lived. Around the two monuments, beautiful stained glass windows can be observed. The sun began to shine as I was about to leave, so I took the opportunity to capture some of the beautiful colors in the play of light. In the Middle Ages there was colorful stained glass in the new church. After the city fire in 1536 and the Delft thunderclap in 1654, a massive gunpowder explosion, nothing remained of it. It wasn't until the 20th century that colored stained glass returned to the new church. So this is not how Vermeer experienced this space, generally speaking. We have seen how the figure of justice shares resemblances with Johannes Vermeer's Woman with the Balance. The kind of postures Vermeer employs in his other works as well seems to have certain affinities with the figures on the memorial monument. While one must always be careful to establish connections between artworks, the proximity of this monument in Vermeer's environment compels me to view it with special attention as a potential Vermeer influence. After all, with Johannes Vermeer you never have to look too far. When we consider artists who influenced him, such as Peter de Hoog and Karel Fabricius, who lived and worked in Delft, it is also important to include these two monuments by Hendrik de Keizer and his son Peter completed it in our understanding of potential influences on Vermeer's artistic development. One last observation. Most of Vermeer's works feature powerful color accents. The woman with the balance doesn't have that. The restrained color scheme seems to be inspired even by the mausoleum of William of Orange. I can easily imagine that the luxurious materials influenced Vermeer in this regard. Everything is subdued except for a few orange accents. And who knows, that might have been a subtle reference intended for a supporter of William of Orange.